following that presentation because I want to give us, well, let me ask you a question. How far are you willing to go to chase your dream? How far? We already talked about LeBron. We just saw LeBron said he went from the hood to the Catholic school across the town. But how far are you willing to go? Are you willing to, to go to an entire different country in search of a hoop dream? And what is that experience like? But, but, but further, can you imagine traveling to a new country, looking for a hoop dream, and playing a sport undocumented? You probably can't imagine. You can't. Most of us in here do not know what that feels like to be in a country and do not have a status, to be on TV playing. You see my name on my back, but there's no official registry of my name anywhere in this country. We don't know. So that, that's what I want to talk to us about today. That way, uh, I'm going to come back to that. Uh, basketball trafficking, you might be asking what that is. The keynote speaker, Dr. Smith and I, we had an opportunity to look at human trafficking cases in high school basketball that came out in media um, since 2015. And what we did was we looked at what was being said about cases that were happening across the United States with black, particularly black international kids at the high school level, which is crazy. Y'all think y'all see something in here with college sport? Where you think they coming from? You trying to solve the world's problems up here, but they know what this is down here. That AAAU prep school basketball, what we're talking about now is crazy. This is nothing new. This is a clean space when you get up in here at this level, but down below it's crazy. So what we call what we have called basketball trafficking is the exploitative and unregulated migration of youth within international interscholastic athletic migration to the US, which in many instances begins with the F1 student visa. Um, and that's directly tied to migration status. Many of us do not think about migration status. Whenever we encourage you, encourage student athletes and students to go study abroad, we do most of the time don't have to talk to them about visa processing. When you go apply for a visa to go to a country, they're not asking you to leave your arm in this country to hope to come back so you are not, well, you will not stay in the United States where you're going. That's what you gotta do. When I'm, I have a Panamanian citizenship, I have a US citizenship, I'm the same person, look at me, I don't change. I cannot enter this country as a Panamanian. I cannot. I cannot come in this country as a Panamanian person. There's almost nothing that I can do at the embassy in Panama the U.S. Embassy, to convince them that when I come here, I will come back home. They don't believe it. That's the kind of country that I come from. So we're going to talk about basketball trafficking and this idea of being found. Being found. And how do we get found? And I want us to pay attention to this language that Masao Jury is using when describing international kids, particularly kids from the continent of Africa. So we can play that small clip. Listen closely to the language, how he describes these young people. We have no more. Job made Ujiri the first African GM in all of Major League Sports. Getting the money helped him expand his camps from Nigeria to 14 other countries across Africa. Ujiri still runs them to this day and still attends them all personally, spending each summer flying from country to country looking to mine a continent that he says is incredibly rich in resources. When I compare it to gold, diamonds, the talent in Africa is abnormal. You can't walk around in so many places and see kids with their hands down to their, yeah. Yeah, down to their knees. Or you go to tribes that where the average height is 6'8". This August, we flew with Ujiri to his camp in Cameroon. to see him in action. Ooh, yeah. Now, I don't know about you, but when I heard diamond mining, gold mining in Africa, unfortunately, I'm gonna have to be stereotypical and say what came to my mind was movies like Blood Diamond. When I think about gold diamond mining, I think about colonization, conquest. I don't think about basketball. That's what I hear. So I, it's, it's, it's important to listen to that. With tribes, where you see people who are six, eight, hands down, their knees 
And I want to bring it closer to home because I'm from Texas and we're in Texas right now to let you know that people are listening and they are going out and mining. Right now in this state, these are the top, top international players in this state that we've been able to identify. Hey, there are a lot of fans of high school basketball in this country. They got all type of message boards, all the information, Max Press, Rivals. They keep the nth on these kids. You can find out a lot of information. So what I know, and I, all these kids are black, by the way. Some come by the way of Europe, but they're African. Um, look at the positions that they play. They all, almost all meet the threshold, 6'8", or better. And this is science, because 90% of all division, y'all can check me on this, 90% of all division one centers and forwards that are from the continent of Africa, I'm missed, all, 90% of all African student athletes that play basketball at the division one level are centers and forwards. It's a pipeline. So now we're seeing this at the high school level. All these high schools, these private high schools that do not act under the regulation of the UIL or state athletic organization, these basketball center prep schools, they don't have to follow these rules. Now, I'm, gonna, now I'm not going to reveal who these kids actually are because it's dangerous, no? Not to have a status in a country and be high profile. But I want to show you how, I don't know for a fact, but there's certain things about their profiles that indicate that these kids might not have the proper migration status here in the United States for basketball. Now, you only can enter the U.S. one or two ways at the high school level to play a sport. You can go to a public school, but you only can be at a public school for 12 months, one academic year. That's all you get. And you have to pay the full cost of attendance. Or you can enter a private school at whatever, at starting after about middle school, and you can stay as long as you have the funds to pay. Now, what usually happens, most of these kids, as you can see, in school of entry have all entered in private school. So they all fit that check mark. Now, in public schools in this state under UIL, we do not allow athletic recu recruitment. We do not allow athletic inducements. So it's very hard, it's difficult when you see the transition to assume that they, are, they have a legal status because all public schools in the state of Texas are not allowed to ask a student their migration status. You cannot do it. And across the country, you have to provide anybody who shows up with education. However, you have 15 days once you transfer from a private, from any institution as an F1 student, 15 days to get all your paperwork straight to be in good legal standing. Now once that, with the new presidential administration that's in that changed this in August of 2018, the moment that you become out of status, you start occurring unlawful presence in the United States. The moment. Before 2018, once the student was, has, has been deemed to be out of status, then the clock starts ticking. But now, every international student, the moment they become out of status, clock is ticking. The clock is ticking. So most of these kids, what it looks like is, is hard. And you can see some of these kids been here only since 2016, and they've been in four schools already. So it's hard to believe that going between four schools in these 15-day time periods, we know how departments work, that they would have all these paperwork in the proper order to maintain the correct legal status in this country. But they're here. And we see cases at the NCAA level now because we understand where the benefits now lie because kids are chasing hoop dreams. The NCAA institution, collegiate institutions, they get these kids as well. But how do you manage young people who do not have the proper status? We've seen it with some power five basketball teams. Some of their international student athletes haven't been able to travel outside the country because there is concern that they might not be let back, allowed back in. It's always a danger when you are somebody from a developing nation. Anytime you leave the country and you have to redo a visa process, you have to prove without a shadow of a doubt to the immigration officer that you have no intention of staying in this country. You go ask a 17-year-old, you, you know right now, do they know what they want to do for the rest of their life? 
But that's what you have to explain every time you go up to that immigration office. Now, it's easier if you're from Canada. They give you the benefit of the doubt. You'll come back. It's easier if you're from some parts of the UK, I mean, some parts of the England, oh, the Europe. They'll give you the benefit of the doubt. But let you be from some West African nation. Let you be from somewhere in Latin America or the Caribbean. Like I said, they say, okay, you, gonna, you can leave your leg here. We don't believe you're going to come back and get it. <laughs> you rather live over there without a leg than come back home. And that's ridiculous. But I want to let you know that going back to, to, to Maasai, that this language is, is, is very damaging. And we have to understand that. Because when we talk about kids as commodities, as diamonds, as gold, as tribes of six, eight people and better, we start to internalize this idea that, oh, them international kids, they just want it better, more than these American kids. We just internalize those things. Oh, that they're better off over here in the U.S. than living in a hut at home. They have water over here. And that's not the case. That is not the case because people like these that you see on the board, they bought into that. You have this young man in, in, in Indiana a couple of weeks ago who was holding a, a Congolese kid passport hostage, 15 years old, to do what he wanted him to do. And he's out of status. You have a Evelyn Mack in November 13th who was finally indicted. 75 kids she sold for $1,000 each to coaches across this country. You know how many students they have officially recovered out of 75? One, two, right? So what I'm saying is I'm not suggesting that basketball at the high school level makes kids undocumented or illegal. I'm, what I'm suggesting, what I'm arguing is that the historic exploitation of black bodies in this athletic industrial complex and racist immigration policies of this country, it forces young people to grapple with the idea of moving into illegality in an exchange for a hoop dream. It's a heck of a decision that they have to make. Y antes que yo me voy a sentar, porque yo sé que usted le gusta, a usted le encanta cuando escucha a mí hablando español. La mayoría de ustedes no saben, no entienden lo que yo estoy diciendo en este momento. Ustedes no saben, pero le gusten. Es algo exótico que le ven de mí. And as I go and take my seat, I refuse to translate what I just said. Because I, I think oftentimes we listen, but we don't hear. We look, but we don't see. So I'm going to let you operate in ambiguity and confusion and, under, and try to understand and make sense of a system when you don't understand it. And it's not in your language. Que le vaya bien. Oh, gracias, gracias. Ahí está.